with us and today we're carrying on our series in Ruth and I'll unpack a bit more about that in a moment but we live in a society today where you don't have to look very far to find examples of people who just carry a sense of entitlement um, and after hearing so much positive about football, I'd like to bring a bit of balance to that. Because um, <laughs> football has provided us, well, probably more than two, but two examples we're going to share in the last week of, it, of exactly this kind of thing working out. So first, the most, arguably the most famous footballer in the world, Cristiano Ronaldo, or at least one of the most famous. On Wednesday night, his team playing Man United, uh, Man United his team Man United playing Tottenham, and he wasn't picked for the team. So before the game had finished, he was on the subs bench, he stormed off down the tunnel and out of the ground, which is like, if you, know, you don't have to know much about football to know that if you're on the subs bench, you don't leave before the game has finished. You're part of the team. Like, um, so talk about a sense of entitlement. Rather than kind of accepting he's quite old now and not as good at football as he used to be, he's getting annoyed that he's still not the centre of attention. Uh, and there's probably other issues that we don't understand going on there. But it, whatever's going on, I think it displays that kind of sense of entitlement. Uh, another example, uh, and this one makes me sad because I quite like him, uh, Jurgen Klopp, um, the manager of Liverpool Football Club, joined their 1-0 win, ironically they actually won the game against Man City, he absolutely lost it with the referee uh, because of a decision that he didn't agree with. And again, like, talk about a sense of entitlement, a manager having to be sent off is, is something in football that just shouldn't be necessary, it shouldn't need to be part of the, foot, uh, of the way football works, that they've had to um, make it so managers themselves can be sent off. Um, so he protested the referee's decision in such an ugly way, really. And he did apologise later, but again, that's that kind of sense of entitlement on display, thinking that it was his right that the referee made the perfect decision from his point of view. Uh, and to be honest, like even if the referee had got it completely wrong, which was not necessarily the case, even if the referee had got it completely wrong, like it's just no, uh, uh, no space, no um, room for the allowance of the fact that the referee's a human being and might not get the perfect decision. So football's an easy target. The challenges with this, but really we see it everywhere, don't we? We see this kind of sense of entitlement coming out in all parts of our lives. I used to be a secondary school teacher and I taught in a school where a lot of the kids came from a middle class background and there was a lot of assuming that they would do fine in their GCSEs without doing any work. It doesn't really work like that. You have to like put some work in. But there's a lot of assumption that life would just be okay for them. That it didn't matter. And the challenge for all of us here is that it's not really just other people or other examples. The challenge comes down to really, if we're honest and we begin to look into our own hearts, there's entitlement that we can find there too. And as we look at this book of Ruth, Ruth shows us a beautifully different way to approach life. How to approach life with a humility, recognising our need for the favour of God. So we come today to start at chapter 2, uh, but to just very briefly bring you up to speed on what's happened so far. So there's a man called Elimelech, Elimelech had taken his family because of a fam uh, because there was a famine in Bethlehem where they were based. He moved his whole family to Moab, and tragically, Elimelech, while they were in Moab, died. And then his two sons also died, leaving Naomi, uh, his widow, and um, the two wives of his sons, who were both Moabites, Ruth and Orpah, behind. So Orpah decides ultimately to stay in Moab, but Ruth goes with Naomi back to Bethlehem, having heard that the famine has ended. And somewhere in all of this, Ruth seems to have gained her own personal faith in Naomi's God. And the overall picture is pretty bleak. I mean, the kind of weather we've got today, that's the right mood, the right time to imagine if we reach this point of the letter um, of the book. But we're just at that point, really, 
where the sun starts to peek in. And as we get into the text this morning, the light gets brighter and brighter as hope begins to break in on this story. Even at the end of last week's uh, passage, actually it wasn't last week, the week before last, when Roger spoke, it said that they arrived in Bethlehem at the time of the barley harvest. And it's just that little, tiny glimmer of hope coming through. So, Ruth 2, 1 to 13. Ruth meets Boaz in the grain field. So we're just going to read the first three verses. We're going to split into three sections uh, and work through it. And there's some there's some amazing stuff in this. So uh, hopefully we'll yeah just gain some real benefit from looking at this this morning. Now Naomi had a relative on her husband's side, a man of standing from the clan of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, go ahead, my daughter. So she went and entered the field and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in the field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So we've met the heroine of the story already in Ruth. This is the moment the hero enters. This is the moment that Boaz turns up on the scene. And the narrator is at pains, really, to make it clear that Boaz is going to be a big deal in this story. And in this story, basically, the more detail that gets given about someone when they first enter the story, the more they're going to feature in the story going forward. And so we immediately find out that this guy is related to Naomi. Um, that he was uh, part of the same clan, a kinsman, part of the same wider family of uh, Naomi's husband, Elimelech. And that's going to be really significant as we go forward in the story, Um, but probably that significance will come out more next week. But it's the way that the narrator is highlighting this is a big deal. And there's there's a deliberate tension on behalf of the author here between two things, which I think is really significant. Ruth's risk-taking faith, Ruth standing up and taking responsibility and going out into the fields to try and sort out the reality of the situation that they need food, and then on the other hand, God's providence. So Ruth's risk-taking faith, she's, she's really a very powerful example of how true faith always leads to action. True faith never just ultimately sits there and nothing results from it. True faith always leads to action. She takes a risky move, taking the initiative, rather than just uh, just waiting to see what happens, she gets out there and goes to gather grain in the field. How is God asking you to step out and put faith into action at the moment? Perhaps there's something you're facing in your life, like Ruth was, that's a real challenge. Maybe God's challenge to you is like, how can you take the initiative in this moment? That's balanced and intention with God's providential care, right? Because it says, it says here, as it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz. One commentator says, like a literal t- translation of the Hebrew text would say something like, as her chance chanced upon the allotted portion of the field belonging to Boaz. And he says that we would probably say that in today's language, as luck would have it. But the author, we know, doesn't believe in chance. He's deploying a deliberate, ironic tactic to make us sit up and take notice. He does it throughout the whole of Ruth. He's making us sit up and take notice of how God's providence is at work. Providence meaning... So providence means like God's sustaining, guiding, and steering of nature, people, and history. So we're both on the big scale and also on the more small individual family scale. So we're meant to learn here that even decisions that are really accidental are under God's providential care. So the narrator is perfectly illustrating that God's gracious providence doesn't override our responsibility to live out our faith. I don't want to get too entangled with what is one of the great theological debates, really. But it's interesting to observe it's only really a theological debate that we often have in the Western world. Most of the rest of the world are quite comfortable with embracing that tension 
that God's in control, that he knows what he's doing, that he's caring for us and meeting our needs, but also what we do matters and we have to take responsibility and step out in faith. Ruth steps out in faith, taking responsibility. Boaz, he chose to harvest his field at that time, but yet these decisions are used to outwork God's providential care. While Jean and I were engaged to be married, we were living in Birmingham, um, and um, Jean was working for herself at the time, but trying to find a job. Uh, we'd, I was still at a year left of uni, and Jean had finished a year before me at uni, um, and so she was looking for work, but we were looking for work at the, the height of the last financial crisis. Um, I know we don't look old enough to have been working back then, but um, that is the reality. We were, we were looking for work um, at a very bad time to be looking for work. Um, and she applied, she applied for the perfect job. She went for an interview, got the job, um, but there was, there was only one problem with that job, really. It turned out that that job wasn't in Oxford, where we wanted to move to, and it, it wasn't in Birmingham, where we were li living, which were the two places she was looking for work. It turned out it was randomly in Northampton. So initially, we were like, oh, what have we done? Like, she's managed to get a job, but it's not where we live or where we want to live. It's, um, uh, yeah, in the middle of nowhere. Um, Sorry if anyone from Northampton. Um, <laughs> I didn't mean to come across so derogatory about Northampton. Um, but actually, it slightly dawned on us that actually this was perfect, because it was actually commut commutable from Birmingham and commutable from Oxford. And in the end, uh, at that point in time, it was the only way we'd have ever really managed to make that move and make that jump and made it financially possible for us to move uh, to Oxford at the time that God was calling us to do so. So G had stepped out and taken responsibility and applying for a job, perhaps a job she wouldn't have applied for if she'd realised where it was, but she took the responsibility for applying for it, nevertheless. But God knew what he was doing and providentially provided a job that enabled us to walk in obedience to what we believe he was asking us to do. So it's important that we learn to embrace this truth that God is working providentially in the bigger picture and in our individual lives. He's sustaining, guiding, steering us. And he's doing that in the bigger picture as well. Because when we embrace that truth, actually, it shouldn't lower our faith to step out. It should increase our faith as we step out. God knows what he's doing. And even when we don't know what's going to happen, he is in control. He's the one who is moving things. Faith in God should always lead to action. So, where is God asking you to step out in risk-taking faith? Are the challenges you're facing where actually what God's saying to you is, you step out and I'll meet you in it. You'll see my providential care. You'll see that I am working all along as you step out. So let's carry on with the text. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that woman belong to? The overseer replied, She's the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field. Don't go away from here. Stay here with the women who work for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the women. And I told the men not to lay a hand on you. And whenever you're thirsty, go and get a drink of the water from the water jars the men have filled. Now, here we immediately get a further picture of Boaz's character, even as he greets the harvesters. Like, I think the whole reason that detail is put in here is just to give us a further picture that this is a godly man. This is a good man. This isn't brought into our context. This isn't just someone who's a Christian who turns up to church on Sundays. His faith infects every part of his work in life. And verse 6 is really interesting because on first reading it can just seem factual. So Boaz asked the harvesters, what does, who does this young woman belong to? And the overseer replied, she is the Moabite who came from Moab with Naomi. So first reading, fact just seems like facts. 
actually, if you read it in the context that this letter was written, it's highly racist and meant to come across that way from the overseer. He's deliberately and intentionally realized they're highlighting where she comes from and what has gone on. And uh, already, um, back in chapter 1, in verse 19 of chapter 1, it talks about how the whole village was stirred. And again, read in the context of the time, everyone would have been like, basically, that's racism on display. That might not be the language they used back in that time, but they were stirred because she was a Malabite woman. They were stirred because of who she was. So the racist response, probably in part, in that day and age was just because she was a foreigner, but greatly increased because she was a Moabite woman. And I said some stuff about the relationship between the, the people of Israel and the people of Moab back in the first talk of the series, so I won't get lost in it again now, let's just say it wasn't a great, um, yeah, not a great relationship between the two nations, let's put it like that. But Boaz, he immediately stands against us. He calls her my daughter. Like hinting at the fact that he already recognises that she's part of the family. I don't know if he's fully worked it out or not yet, but he already recognises something about her being part of the people in that. And it shows as well, it's just a tender way to speak to her, a caring way to speak to her, pushing back at probably what she's heard is basically racism, but like it's not recorded what the conversations were like with, between Ruth and the overseer exactly. But we're assuming that probably was a fairly racist and hard interaction for Ruth. And he immediately pushes back against the racism and the other's shame. And, and Boaz, he could have done nothing. He could have not acted. He could have like not been racist himself, but just chosen to largely ignore the situation. But he's a great example of how there's a need to stand against evils such as racism, not to just not participate in them, but to actually use our influence and our voice to stand against it and to stand for what is right. Boaz got properly involved. In fact, as a man of standing in community, his actions, not just here, but the actions that we'll see in the rest of this letter, they cost him loads, probably, in terms of his reputation, and they definitely cost him financially, because it tells us about that directly later on. And he goes on, he gives her food and the dignity of work, permission to glean. There were actually Old Testament laws, such as Leviticus 19.9, that when you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time or pick up the grapes that have fallen Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. And while those laws were over that people, this was a really dark time in their history, and most people think that probably there were very few people living by them. But it seems that Boaz was. He was a godly man. Even before he arrived, his workers had still, however racist they might have been, they kind of knew that their boss would be unhappy, I think, if they didn't let her start to gather grain. So, not only is he providing uh, food for Ruth, he's giving her the dignity of allowing to work for it herself. So, I think there's lessons in that and challenge for us in how we seek as we go forward as a church to support the poor, the vulnerable, refugees. Like, how can we not just maybe provide immediate emergency support, but actually give people dignity, actually give people space to earn a living for themselves, to find a way to get food, in this case, for herself, literally. And he treats her like one of her female workers, telling her to use the water the men had drawn and the shelter provided. Even there, there's just, there's just so much in that. In that day and age, uh, the men wouldn't have drawn water for the women, it would have been the other way round. And higher ranking people wouldn't have drawn water for lower ranking people, even when in Boaz's workers, the higher ranking workers wouldn't have been drawing water for the lower ranking workers. It was very, very kind of, yeah, class orientated and where your station was in life. Um, he provides protection for her as well. Um, this argument here is an early example of like an anti-sexual harassment uh, law taking place. Um, he clearly felt there was a genuine risk of her being taken advantage of by the men. Uh, but what else would have been so clear to them about keeping their hands off of her? So Boaz was quite a guy. 
There is so much that we can learn from him. Um, let's keep going. Read the final three verses we're going to look at today. And this, at, sorry, at this, she bowed down with her face to the ground and she asked him, Why have I found favour in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? And Boaz replies, I've been told about all that you've done with your mother-in-law since the death of your husbands. How you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with your pe- with a people you did not know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you've come to take refuge. May I continue, and then she replied, may I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she says. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, for I do not have the standing of one of your servants. So, so much that we've seen in this passage already, but I think there's one bigger message that kind of only becomes clear as you read this final bit, and that's that word favour. So that word favour comes out three times in this passage, twice in the bit we just read, once back in verse 2 that I think will pop up on the screen at the top there again. So Ruth humbly initially, she goes out seeking favour as she goes to glean in verse 2. Then in verse 10, it says she acknowledges that she's found favour. Then in verse 13, she recognises that this favour is going to be an ongoing favour. And Ruth just here shows us something so different to this sense of kind of constant entitlement that so many seem to live with in our society today. How might it look different? Like, how might someone display that kind of sense of entitlement? How might we display that sense of entitlement? I guess by expecting people to do things for us, to show us kindness, to show us respect, to meet and serve our needs, to expect our rights to be met, to become upset or angry if we don't feel that we're getting what we feel we're owed or deserve. If we don't get what we feel is our rights. I'm very pro human rights. Human rights wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the Christian faith. They look at the history of them, it all comes from people talking about how everyone was made in the image of God. Um, but this is this is different to like the general principle of human rights. This is when individuals get all kind of yeah, worked up, I guess. <laughs> about wanting their own rights and making sure that they get what is their right rather than a general care for everyone receiving what's right. And the danger as well with harbouring entitlement, it isn't just the resentment, the anger, the bitterness that can form in our hearts from having that sense of entitlement there. It's this, it's that we miss the wonder, the joy, the utter privilege when we gain something that we don't deserve, that we're not owed, that we're not at all entitled to. I discovered some entitlement in my own heart the other day while on the phone to Scottish Power. Um, trust me, I think most people would have found somewhere. <laughs> repeatedly trying to explain the situation, repeatedly getting the same answer. Can I talk to someone else? No. Can I complain? No, I've given you a solution. I can't complain, but you haven't given me this. <laughs> anyway, it <laughs> will come up again if I'm not careful. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just kind of reached a point on the phone where I was just so angry and frustrated that I was just like, to be honest, I was probably just being more rude to this poor guy who was just doing his job than really actually ever going to achieve anything. It was just kind of that sense that I should be able to sort this out on this phone call right now. This is ridiculous. It's been going on for ages. Um, trying to tell you that our electric meter is going back backwards, you probably want to know about that and do something about that, but never mind, they don't. Um, um, yeah, I've got some more stuff to build with um, There have been times in my life as well when, yeah, perhaps more seriously than that, I realised I've got frustrated with circumstances and situations that I found myself in, and I found myself thinking something along the lines of, God, this isn't meant to happen to me. Like I'm aware, I can still have people, but, but not, not, not to me. And th- there's no promise, you see, in the Bible, is there an easy life, a comfortable life of following Jesus? In fact, we're promised the opposite, yet we so often begin to think that we're like, 
Yeah, <laughs> ask questions of God, whether he's doing the right thing. Get disappointed with God, like he's done something wrong, when things get tricky, when that's not what we've been promised. We must take care that we don't form a Christian version of entitlement, which is basically makes comfort and getting what we want equal God's blessing. Whereas God says, like, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are those who are persecuted for my name's sake. Blessing isn't quite what we sometimes equate it with. We can have nothing, literally nothing in this eyes world, and yet be as blessed as anyone on this planet by God. Everything in our life can go wrong, and yet we have Jesus, we can be exceptionally blessed and have reason to praise him. James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud, but shows favour or grace to the humble. And this is what Ruth beautifully displays, isn't it? God's attracted to humility, starting with the humility of recognising our utter need for him. There's a tension in the text as you read it, like sometimes it's talking about Boaz and it almost feels like it's talking about God and then that becomes really clear towards the end of these verses where Boaz then does directly talk about Ruth, finding favour from God. It's vital to remember God doesn't owe us anything. We owe him absolutely everything, he owes us nothing. The whole world is his, he made it all, he made us. The route to being saved is all through what he has done. We must learn to kill off the sense of entitlement in our hearts. And how do we kill it? Well, Ruth helps us with that as well by the question that she asks. She asks this question of Boaz, but this is a question we all need to learn to ask of God, and as often as possible, because the answer is so important. So at this, she bowed down on her face to the ground, and she said, why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me a foreigner? In verse 12, the answer. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel, in the whose wings you come to take refuge. And John Piper really helped me unpack this. He said, in spite of the word repay, this verse doesn't encourage us to picture Ruth as an employee of God providing needed labour that then, as an employer, rewards with a good wage. The picture is of a God as a great winged eagle and Ruth as a threatened eagle is coming under the safety of the eagle's wings. Boaz does not mean that she'll find favour with God because of her work. Rather, she found favour with God by coming under his wings as an undeserving Moabites. And in the strength of that favour, she was working. So you see, Boaz is more than just Mr. Right at the right time. He's meant to think and make us think about Jesus, who incidentally himself came at exactly the right time. There's a clear link between the word favour in the Old Testament and the word grace in the New Testament. Uh, so much so that that verse we read before James 4 6, God's opposed to the proud, but gives grace or favour to the humble, the translators can't decide which is the best one to use. Grace is perhaps best defined in short form as undeserved or unmerited favour. God's riches at Christ's expense is sometimes the acronym that people use and I think it's a helpful word. Jesus displays ultimately in the cross as he dies for our sins, taking our punishment, taking what we deserve onto himself, taking our guilt and shame. He didn't deserve to die, we did. We didn't deserve to be shown favour, but he shows his favour anyway. We didn't deserve any of this grace, but we get it anyway. He came offering us a grace, not just to be saved, but a grace that gives us strength to live for him day by day. And in his grace, he generously pours out the Holy Spirit, which is an incredible grace gift of God. God himself living in us, equipping us to live for him every day. We have already heard read earlier uh, 2 Corinthians 12 9, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. So back to that question that rephrased into Jesus' grace language. I guess in our terms it's something like, Father, how can you show me such grace, such undeserved favour? A sinner who wasn't looking for you, but you came and found me. Why do you even notice me? 
And it's not because of what you've done, but simply because you've come to Jesus. And even in that, when we look back with hindsight, we only come to Jesus because his Holy Spirit was already working in our lives and born so. Even that part's really his work as well. So whatever you currently think of God in faith, you can know this faith that you use is definitely getting loud, isn't it? There's no exclusive club. This is for anyone. What we bring to the deal, the only thing that we really bring to this deal is we bring our mess, we bring our sin, we bring our brokenness, we bring our undeserving attitudes, and Jesus brings all of the rest. We simply can't save ourselves. We can't do things for God. Apart from his grace, there's nothing. There is no real refuge without Jesus. We need his favour and his grace in our own way. This is the picture, I think, hopefully. So this is the picture that's painted. The eagle defending the little chicks in the nest, keeping them safe. That's the place where we need to be. We find safety in him, we find strength in the weakness, even in recognising that we need that. The weirdest little ones down here. We're not the big evil, that's God's. We're the little tiny ones being sheltered by his wings. And just a little bit more of John Piper. God's not an employer looking for employees. He's an eagle looking for people who take refuge in his wings. He's looking for people who will be father and mother and homeland or anything else that might hold back from a life of love on the wings of Jesus. So we see Ruth leave our homeland, took huge risks in faith, and she was strengthened to do it because she knew that this was the safe place to be. Under the wings of God. So the kind of risk-taking faith we see here arises when we believe and trust in a God who does care providentially, and we know that whatever life throws at us, we can always be in this place. We can be in the worst of circumstances, but still, in this place of safety. So three quick four applications as we learn this. Be easy, be really easy to take this message and essentially be like, be more like Boaz, he was a really good man. Be more like Faith, uh, be more like Ruth, she was a really good woman who demonstrated Faith. You should be more like Faith as well, she's also a very good woman. Um, <laughs> there are like, yeah, there's so much that you could draw out from that. You could look at injustice, serving the poor, and it would all be good. But perhaps more important than that is not just trying to work really hard to be more like that, but where does the very means come from to live with that kind of faith? And it comes from being in this place, in this picture that we had a moment ago. Killing any sense of entitlement by bowing down and confessing our unworthiness. The humility that Ruth demonstrates as she bows now. Taking refuge under the wings of God. And Burby being continually astonished by his grace. So worship and thankfulness helps kill any sense of enticement. Getting lost in wonder and awe. Because Jesus, he is the one who wonders. He is the holy of holies. He is the king of kings. He is the one who humbled himself to the point of death, giving his very life for us, stepping into our broken worlds. He's the one who took on death and one. He is our risen conqueror. He is our only hope. We don't deserve any of it. And fourthly, this is on the screen, but continue to remember that just as Boaz was reached out and came through, my daughter, God does the same for us, my daughter, my son. And from this place, it's possible to be more like Ruth, stepping out in faith, leaving the comfort of the homeland, taking the initiative of working hard. It's possible to be more like Boaz, fighting sexual and racial injustice, helping bring dignity to the poor and vulnerable, representing Jesus in both what we say and what we do. Our city needs more Ruth and Boaz's, but just trying harder to get there won't change much but coming under the wings of refuge of the Almighty God, then anything is possible. Um, we're just about out of time, but I'd love us just to sing just a little bit of a song, and then I'll pray for us really briefly.